Thank you, Scott, and thank you to everyone for being here. Uh, I think it's obvious from the size of this crowd what a rock star librarian Carla Hayden is. <laughs> We're glad everyone found their way here because we had to change the venue three times to get a large enough place. Uh, the Fowler sold out in 12 hours. We came here with 500 people and still a waiting list to get people here. So that tells you how excited the Los Angeles community is to welcome her and how perfect it is to have her both for the year of the book and to celebrate the 1958 founding of the School of Library Service, which became the Graduate School of Library Information Studies, which became the Department of Information Studies. Dr. Hayden has been profiled in the New Yorker the uh, Time Magazine, The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Guardian in England. Uh, you know, by now, everyone knows, knows the basic facts as the, the 14th librarian of Congress. Is, uh, she's the first woman to hold this position. <laughs> she is the first African American and the first woman of color to hold this position. She was nominated in 2016 by President Barack Obama. <laughs> and she came to know the Obamas when she was head of the Chicago Public Library. Okay. From uh, 1993 to 2016, Dr. Hayden was the Chief Executive Officer of the Enoch Pratt Free Library in Baltimore and a very distinguished history there. As president of the American Library Association, she led the library community opposition to the Patriot Act. She has, she has fought censorship, she has fought e for equal access, she has fought for children in libraries, she has fought for all of us for her entire career. She has earned many, many uh, awards, the Newberry Award, the uh, Library Journal Award. My personal favorite, though, is Ms. Magazine Woman of the Year. <laughs> <laughs> um, early in her career, she was also a library educator. She was on the faculty at the University of Pittsburgh, where I got my MLS degree. And that's after receiving her master's and her doctorate from the University of Chicago. <laughs> and she, is, she has numerous other honorary doctorates as well. Uh, the Library of Congress is an institution that preserves the past, it provides access to knowledge in the present, and it builds collections to serve our nation in the future. This is a very daunting and critical task, particularly in these days of challenges to the quality of information and to, and to knowledge. She has developed not only a strategic plan, but she has developed a digital strategy for the Library of Congress. And as a member of the Scholars Council of the Library of Congress, I've had the privilege of working on some of those initiatives to help move them forward into the next century and the next, uh, the next generations. Now, let us hear from Dr. Hayden herself. Please welcome to UCLA, the 14th Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. giving Christine a side hug because she broke her arm. And that's the only reason why I'm not giving her a bear hug, because we have been colleagues for such a long time. And she has, uh, when she said she's part of the Scholars Council that helped with the Library of Congress's uh, digital strategy, she's being modest. And I wanted her to be on that council because I knew she would bring zest <laughs> and zeal and really an open mind to what the largest library in the world could do. So thank you, Christine. My pleasure, my honor. And Provost Wah, <laughs> Mr. Provost, 
we love you because your mother was a librarian. <laughs> <laughs> and you're sitting next to my mother, <laughs> who never tires of hearing uh, introductions or seeing uh, my library peeps, as I call them, and call all of you. And so thank you uh, for what you are doing for the school. Um, and the faculty members, the students, the, all the librarians who are here, it is truly a privilege for me to be here. Not only is um, Dr. Boardman here, but uh, the woman who was very generous to me in my career as a, as a baby librarian, uh, Dr. Beverly Lynch. Uh, and when I was um, elected ALA president, she was the one who gave me a lot of advice on how to do it and work full time. The other person who I'm really delighted to see is the uh, only second uh, person of color, African American, to become Librarian of the Year in over 23 years, Ms. Sky Patrick from <laughs> LA County, the director. Now, uh, full disclosure, I think she said, I could tell you this, um, Sky worked with us as a baby librarian at the Pratt Library. And she went away and she got her degree and she was just great and she came back. And she had to go because she needed to do more and be more. And so we're just so proud. I'm just sending greetings from the Pratt Library colleagues uh, to you for that. Now I also met and had a chance, because uh, I couldn't resist uh, seeing some of you face to face and going out. So I have a number of new friends. One, of course, so was an old friend. She said, I don't, don't call her old, but Miss Claudette, I can't, just right there, <laughs> uh, her PhD. She said, don't call me an old friend. I'm still young. But now I know Wanda, I know Ruby, and the students, but Xavier. Uh, Xavier, could you please stand up? A young librarian. <laughs> USC, who was so sweet to me when I came in. And I said, are you a librarian? You look 12. <laughs> but he, he was great. And so I just thank all of you for being here and for doing, because it is uh, an honor to be here with, while you celebrate the year of the book, and also that 60th anniversary. One of the people that you had speak for your series is a person that I quote often, Alberto Manguel. He, his book, <laughs> and so I'm gonna tell you why, because in some of the um, introduction, you heard about uh, freedom of access, equity of access in, in my career. Oh, just a side note, yes, my mom's favorite award was the Ms. Magazine because Selma, <laughs> no, because Selma Hayek was there. <laughs> so that was, that was the highlight for her. Uh, but the reason why Alberto Manguel, his history of reading, and I quote from it almost every time I get a chance to talk about the importance of, of literate society, in that chapter, Forbidden Reading, uh, the cover uh, page facing, it's introducing that chapter has a photo of, a rare photo of an African-American woman, looked like she was recently uh, a slave, but she had a book uh, and she's standing in the cabin. And in that chapter, he says basically, and uh, almost word for word, as centuries of slave owners, dictators, and other illicit holders of power have always known, an illiterate crowd is the easiest to rule. Amen. And if you cannot prevent people from learning to read, the next best recourse is to limit its scope. And that entire chapter, Forbidden Reading, shows book burning, all of the attempts over time to restrict people from either learning to read or 
having access to information through books. The quote that I often use is Frederick Douglass's, and the American Library Association publishes um, a bookmark. Once you learn to read, you'll be forever free because you can't unlearn reading. Once you can read a few words, you can read all. It was very notable uh, when I had the opportunity to be uh, sworn in at, um, as Librarian of Congress on the Lincoln Bible. Uh, and what I wanted to do was, uh, in that talk of acceptance and gratitude, was to list, because I am the first person of color, descended from people who were forbidden to read, uh, a list of all of the laws from those times preventing them from the whippings and the mutilations and all of the, and by states, the states, and just go through and talk about the punishments. And my dear mother said, Carla, that would be a downer. <laughs> Can we just put, you couldn't read, <laughs> and move on. Uh, so, but that's so that the significance, and of course being the first female is also significant because of dear Mr. Dewey, um, who famously said that women, uh, when he said that women at the Columbia Library School, uh, that he founded, uh, he said that uh, it might be time to have women join the profession because they could endure pain and repetitive work um, for long hours. And so it was time to let women in to be uh, professionals. So when I get a chance to be around uh, people in the library profession and the archives, it is so energizing. Just today, I was able to go to one of the heights of special librarianship and archives at the um, Paramount Studios. And one of the archivists there started as a security guard at Paramount Studios. And he saw uh, some of the work of the archives and the filming and things. And he wanted to know, how could I do that? And he enrolled right here, UCLA's Information Studies, got his degree, and now he is a wonderful archivist at Paramount Studios. And he wanted to tell me that when he heard I was coming here tonight, that that's what the inspiration, and to have a school right here, where he, and he worked all through school still as a security guard at Paramount Studios, and then now is one of their top archivists, restoring films uh, from the silent era, Star Wars, all of these types of things. So, Also, I got a chance to go to the Disney archives, and there's a Disney librarian here, uh, and to see that type of uh, specialized web development and what they're doing. And of course, right here, you are you have your children's literature archive and digital archive. So when I, they said, well, what would you be interested in talking about in terms of the uh, year of the book? Uh, I said, libraries in the digital age. And then I said, now what? Because <laughs> we've been talking about libraries in the digital age. We're in it. We're here. This is it. Now what? And so when you think about the fact that we're at a time that we're claiming it in terms of information literacy, uh, we have, we say we're the original Google, uh, we have buttons and t-shirts, the original search engines, librarians. <laughs> uh, I have the bag, we carry it around. Uh, speaking of, uh, information accuracy, which is our time to say we can help you uh, determine what the best sources might be and how to determine accuracy. And I just wonder, uh, just aside on that note, 
someone said, but how can we, uh, how can we step into this space? And, because we're not always sure. I said, we're surer than most. <laughs> so I don't think we should be afraid of at least claiming that space, that we are information professionals and we nine times out of 99.9 .9 times, it, we, you could trust us. <laughs> so, and if we're wrong, we'll tell you right away. So, but don't be afraid to claim it. Um, so here we are, I thought, now what? Because in being at the Library of Congress, the world's largest library, 171 million items, 836 miles of shelving, storage modules that look like Amazon warehouses, Expo collections in over 200 or so languages, every aspect of world culture, collecting marking, things that are so unique, the original draft of the Declaration of Independence, I was uh, just at, uh, speaking about Abraham Lincoln last night, and we have the copy of the Gettysburg Address that is believed that he took onto the field in his own hand. The papers of 23 presidents from George Washington to Coolidge, the papers of Rogers and Hammerson, George and Ira Gershwin, the largest comic book collection in the world, the largest law library, the largest collection of Bibles. There's times when I get like, is there anything the library doesn't collect? We have body parts. <laughs> we have hair, 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 hair. We do have the life mask of Abraham Lincoln. We have the contents of his pockets the night he was assassinated. Two spectacles, a $5 uh, Confederate bill, and a button that did come off of his jacket. All of these treasures. And so, when thinking of strategic planning and what next, the, the library has been uh, very involved in, as you probably know, uh, digitizing as many of uh, the collections as possible. The library is also involved in a project, Bibframe, which is bringing uh, Mark, and it was the home of Mark, and all of that into um, a web-based environment. However, we needed to really think about how we would ingest digital information and how we would make it available. And so, in developing a new strategic plan, and this was a strategic plan, and I'm so thankful nobody groaned when I said strategic plan, <laughs> because sometimes it elicits groans. Strategic planning can be uh, one of those things, as many of you know, uh, that uh, you need to really think about how you're going to get everyone in the organization involved in thinking ahead when there's so much to do right now. And that's uh, to look forward to a future you can't see. We knew that at this library, and that was the challenge, to look at the possibility of being more user-centered digitally enabled and data driven, the three concepts over the entire enterprise. And that enterprise includes the aspects of a special library with all of these special materials. It also has uh, a very critical role as the Library of Congress serving Congress and the staff members. Over 400 people are directly serving members of Congress and their staff. They are the research arm of the U.S. Congress. And they provide authoritative and objective information to Congress on every subject. You have policy teams, energy, uh, health care, every, every aspect, lawyers. So they're working in teams, information professionals and the policy experts working. As you can imagine, being that research arm of Congress, the demand to be digitally enabled is critical. They have to be available 24-7.
and in the latest formats. I think it is uh, no secret that the challenge of a library with so many parts, oh, I guess right, the Copyright Office, and you have a whole universe of users, Disney, uh, the very high-tech companies, uh, creators, users, all wanting to make sure that rights informations are safeguarded in the information world. That's that special uh, aspect, as well as serving a smaller population, but just as important in terms of digital, the National Library Services for the Blind and Physically Handicapped. Moving from tapes and sending things through the post office to people who have uh, visual difficulties. Now, how do you do that in the digital age? If it's going to be delivered digitally, you have to look at the fact that a lot of the population that you're serving is not digitally, uh, let's say, aware or able to use that. So how to get this largest uh, library with all of these different demands and a culture of uh, very much being aware, and Christine uh, was right in the middle of it. That's why I wanted to, uh, Christine and UCLA, and that helped a lot, UCLA <laughs> coming in and helping uh, to think about how we could be in this age not just digitizing and doing uh, some of the basics, but expanding our reach and reaching out and being more collaborative. And so the general strategic plan was the first time we had all of these units thinking together about who their users are and whoever the user group would be, how can you reach them digitally and uh, effectively? And also how can you use the information that we collect so much. Well, it was a success because by the time we finished, we had tiger teams, we had uh, some of our younger, uh, new uh, librarians mixed in with the uh, experts who had patches on their arms and <laughs> were uh, experts in Mesopotamian thimbles. All of this, we, we, we did a, saw some soft stuff at first. We had a, a, a thing of participating in History Day, National History Day, where we, we had uh, high school students from all over the country and a couple of middle schoolers uh, interact online with our curators. Uh, at first, it was a little bumpy, I can tell you. And then we said, oh. Part of the problem is some of the more mature staff members, uh, expert, 40 years, you know, could tell you what Benjamin Franklin had for dinner every night when he was in Paris <laughs> and could tell you what that meant and when he became vegetarian for a while. So we had those and then we paired them with the younger staff members who were coming right out of library schools like UCLA that knew all of these kind of things. And so they were at the keyboard. And then we had the kids. So at first, kids, uh, Becky from Oklahoma wants to know how many books does the library have? So speaking of a groan, in the room I could say, oh, I could hear it. Some of the curators were like, this is what technology is gonna do? <laughs> What I thought, oh man. Oh, so, that and all that. Then, what's the smallest book that you have? Oh, okay. Um, uh, and there's a few more questions. Until the question came, were there any founding fathers back in the revolutionary time that were vegetarians? And you could see the expert just, his eyes lit up. <laughs> he was like, oh, oh there's some intelligent child somewhere. <laughs> but, 
And he just went forth, and then the younger person was like, well, I'm sorry, you know, we have to make it short, everything like that. But it just was so wonderful to see that matching and that pairing of the knowledge base. And as we go forward in the digital age, and we have generational expertise, and we have uh, people, especially our staffs, who are experts to find a way that they can still contribute and be honored in that digital age. Because with the digital strategy, uh, we have made that a part of the strategic plan and we got everyone involved, the digital strategy. And that's where we have uh, designated for the first time a digital strategy officer, Ms. Kate Sward. And she is really a dynamo. They're looking at me, they're giving me the five uh, minute bell and I told them to, because I said, if I get up here and start talking about that, we will be here all night. But the digital strategy, first time ever. Three basic concepts. We will throw open the treasure, treasure chest, that is the Library of Congress. Everything that you just heard about, we'll inspire a long, long relationship with every visit, whether it's online, particularly, or in person. We will bring the library to our users. We will welcome other voices, being more collaborative, being in partnership. We will drive momentum in our communities and especially the uh, library community and also making connections with uh, technology companies. We will invest in our future we're going to cultivate an innovation culture. And to do that, we, we one of the more, we took out cubicles and we made a kind of Apple-like thing with people. <laughs> and small, but we're getting there. <laughs> we will in, uh, ensure enduring access to content and we'll build toward the horizon. And with those types of things, we think that with the reaching out will be important. So, our last treasure that I want to mention is, and talk about is that Gettysburg Address. We recently launched a program, a crowdsourcing program, first time for the Library of Congress. And there were a few things. We're gonna let the general public transcribe these documents. We started with, we started, with letters to Abraham Lincoln. There are 28,000 letters that people sent Abraham Lincoln that haven't been reviewed except in person since the library received those letters. And that was the first. So we launched it, we brought out a copy of that copy under guard. We had, they had like almost machine guns standing there. <laughs> but we brought it out, we invited high schoolers from the D.C. area to, to really help us launch it. We had a high schooler recite the Gettysburg Address, but then they started transcribing. And now it's open source, a platform, Concordia, that anyone can use. And so we're committed to that's our now what? Being open, making sure that we collaborate, and being part of an effort. I'll close and before I sit down and with this. I was at, and, and as librarian, you get invited to different uh, types of uh, workshops and things like that. And I was the only librarian there. And this gentleman uh, looked at me and he said, you know, you're librarian of Congress. And he said, you know, you library people. <laughs> Do you realize that if you with 15,000 libraries, public libraries in the country, and those are the systems, with all the university libraries, with all the libraries. If you all got together and started working together, do you know how much of an economy and how much of a slice of that information segment you would be? And I said, ah, now that's a strategy. <laughs> now what? <laughs> Thank you. So, Thank you. We need to work together. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hayden. Thank you for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. I speak uh, for all of us, the entire 
Bruin family, the entire UCLA community is delighted by your presence, by your thoughts, by your leadership. We're delighted to have you at UCLA. We are very happy to continue our conversation and for our audience, my name is Marcelo Suarez Orozco. I am the Dean of the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at UCLA. I'm joined here by my uh, colleague, Virginia Steele, the Norman and Armina Powell Librarian, University Librarian at UCLA, and by Christine Borgman, our Distinguished Research Professor in the Department of Information Studies. For this uh, panel conversation, the three of us would like to pose some questions to generate a, a, a conversation and then have a discussion about the uh, topics. Uh, you mentioned the Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian fables. So which one is your favorite? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's not my first question. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have so many pinch me moments in the Library of Congress. I of mean, literally, when you see that the correspondence between Sigmund Freud and Albert Einstein, when you see uh, Paganini's uh, manuscripts next to Mozart, and then you have the, the musicologist say, and notice that Leonard Bernstein, because they have their, his archives, and Mozart and George Gershwin, when they got to the piano parts, they just did this because they were going to play it. Mm. So, so you're, pinch me moments, so it's just so every day. That's so why I witness? started tweeting. Witness? <laughs> Your witness? I tweet. I tweet. Uh, well, and <laughs> I have help. Other than the pinch me moment, what, what crosses your mind when you come across these fundamental uh, documents? It's how can we share this? How can we let so many people, all the people that could benefit from having these pinch me moments. Rosa Parks, we just digitized the Rosa Parks collection where you see in her own hand that she was like a, a Uber uh, manager for the bu bus boycott. She was more than that lady on the bus with the purse. How can you <laughs> let people see these things? Because they're on the, just so much and using technology and how do you use it and how do you uh, think about uh, and what do you, beyond just digitizing and that, but the metadata and sharing that and being open, that, that's, that's what I think about quite a bit. So Kate Sward is leading that effort for us. Beautiful, here we are in the great city of Los Angeles, one of the most diverse cities in our country. Talk a little bit about how you endeavor to engage our youngest Americans and our newest Americans. Ah. And I did a lot of that work, of course, uh, before. And so in thinking about what could the Library of Congress do, one of the first things is to expose the young people to the collections. And there's a wonderful program in Baltimore called, with the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra called Ork Kids. It's a play on or kids, but also that they are orchids too, waiting to, to grow and bloom. And so we brought those kids over, and they are energetic, and here they are in this, this place, but we showed them Leonard Bernstein's collection, and they liked his sixth grade uh, report cards that showed he had C's, <laughs> <laughs> right? So they're like, oh, and this is supposed to be a really, something he got C's. And they spent time with their, uh, they met those musicologists who talked about all the things and what they were seeing and about what he did. And then they came back and performed uh, and did a concert at the Library of Congress. And they started out with their original composition based on their research of the archives and they talked about who he was and all of this and, then, and they sang and they looked like America, all colors and shapes and everything and they started out a cappella, I want to be in America. 
And then they rapped, and then they did some other stuff. And, <laughs> but it was all based on that. So they're back again this, uh, just last month, and they're going to do uh, Scott Joplin and African American music. And so they're bringing out our Billy Strahan. We just got his collection and that, and they're going to come back and do it. And so engaging young people, letting them uh, interact with the materials, having the uh, curators and the librarians talk about because they know so much. And uh, it's so that's we also have plans to have a youth center for engagement and civic uh, learning because we think we have a place in that civic uh, and informed citizenry role. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. Beautiful. This is, I assume, what you mean when you said libraries are the cornerstone yes. of democracy. Anyone can walk in. Anyone can, and we don't, we only ask enough of you to find out what you want. That's it. Beautiful. <laughs> if, I, if I may quote one of the authors in your 170 million items in your shop, who said, quote, access to knowledge is the superb, the supreme act of truly great civilizations. It is. Of all the institutions that prepare to do this, free libraries stand virtually alone. Toni Morrison. Mm -hmm. She just um, gave, uh, she has a program called um, Bench, uh, Benches on the Road. And she put, her foundation put one at the Library of Congress for the first African-American um, librarian, Daniel Murray. And it's now in front of the uh, historic Thomas Jefferson building, and there's a dedication to him. Jeannie, Chris, thoughts? So I, as, as you talk and talk about these wonderful treasures, I think about the collections that we have in our libraries across the country and, and wonder how we can work with you, those of us who are in academic libraries, in public libraries, in school libraries, special libraries, uh, because we too have treasures. Right. <laughs> and we want, to, we want to support, we're here on the West Coast, but we want people on the West Coast to be aware of what's at the Library of Congress. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here with my colleagues and we went to the Disney and the Paramount because the Library of Congress is the guardian of the nitrate and the older films for those studios. And right. the, the connection needs to be, but also the scholarship because at, at Disney they have all of the um, sketches for all of that animation and the, the archives. They're, they're working on their metadata, so connecting the collections. And that's the strength. If we look at the synergies between uh, the treasures that are all over, there you got treasures. I mean, this, it just blows your mind when you think about when you make those connections. The Harvard uh, Schlesinger Library for, and that specializes in women's studies, we're working on a, exhibit for women's suffrage. We have Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Mary Church Terrell, plus the organization, but they have so much too. So how do we cross pollinate, cross um, uh, advertise, make connections? The C also should be to other collections. Um, and really think about, um, now we, we have to be cognizant that sometimes we would like some of those collections <laughs> at other places. It's okay, but as long as we know that they're safe and that they, we're all sharing, that's it. Because we can't, one, one institution can't have it all and shouldn't. It should be where people can come to this campus 
and have access to what's at the Library of Congress, what's at the National Archives, what's at all of these libraries. The, then the British Library, Bibliothèque Nationale, so we're doing more with the international. And I said, well, the Library of Congress could help with uh, coordinating or thinking or reaching out and being part of saying, let's connect, let's try to have this community. Think how much richer a person's experience would be if they're sitting and they have all of these things. We'd have to make sure everybody gets their sleep. So, cause <laughs> can you imagine if you start with those two archives, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's wonderful. But that's what we need, because that informs citizenry, uh, giving people choices. Yes, and helping them find, yes. identify what they want and find it, get access to it. Now, working with school libraries is important. Yes. And working with teachers who don't always get that in their teacher education program. So what we, when we've been working out, we have a program called Teaching with Primary Resources. And one thing that we're hearing from teachers is make it easier for us technology-wise. All teachers, they, they're strapped for time. They don't always have color printers at home. They don't have some of the resources. So when you're making all your curricular things for us to download, think about us and make it easy to find, easy to do. We don't want to have to go through a maze to get at your stuff. And that's been very helpful to actually talk to teachers in the field. Yes, we would use your wonderful treasure chest, but I need that Benjamin Franklin thing right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I have to share my printer with my two kids. <laughs> so. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Chris, how are we doing in our digital strategy? We have a lot of work to do. Yes. <laughs> uh, but Kate Svard is bringing just incredible energy. I mean, she it's just is. she and that team, they are just like, jumping right off the floor around there. And they really are trying to bring those, those pinch me moments to the screen. I mean, I think it's going to be pinch me in other ways, but it's going to be a whole lot of pinching of, of great stuff. And the, you know, as you were saying, bring the libraries together, that's one of the real opportunities with yes. digital content. And UCLA has led the way in things like bringing together the cuneiforms from around the world in digital form. The Getty has led in bringing the Dunhuang documents together from around the, you know, you will never repatriate those materials. Right. But you can repatriate them digitally and you can compare them and combine them. And so as scholars and, and our graduate students, particularly in the information studies and the data science fields too, are just chomping to get, try their machine learning algorithms, to bring together the text and the visual and the sound recordings and, uh, and pull those together, not just from LC, but from, library, from UCLA, yes. every place else. So what kinds of partnerships should we be thinking about for our doctoral dissertations, for our research grants, for our, our partnering with you and really moving that forward? Well, we are going to be, when we said uh, open, and part of the community, we want to be a learning lab too. And that's what is a part of it that says uh, innovation and being not just innovation, in-house innovation, but having people help us be innovative. And so that's what we've tasked Kate to look at. What are the strategic partnerships with different, and excuse me, sometimes I slip and say library schools, showing my age. Uh, <laughs> but information studies and I schools and things that to partner with them to have them um, experiment and do research with our collections and that would be very very helpful and to think about and um, be very intentional about what the library needs uh, we just received some very generous funding uh, to help with our arrearage with our collections uh, there were people, and there's nothing more effective than being, and my colleague knows, being at a, a budget hearing, and you talk about the, the personages waiting, their collections waiting there, and imagine them standing behind me at the hearing. There's Teddy Roosevelt, Clara Barton, 
and all of this. And, and you see their eyes go, wow, because they're thinking of these people. <laughs> but these collections that need to be processed, uh, just that, but then the metadata and all of those types of things. There are a lot of needs that the library has that if we could partner and be very intentional about looking at those and where are the research opportunities and internships and research scholars mm -hmm. that could uh, be involved. That would be very helpful. Well, I think we have no shortage of students who would love to come and do that. <laughs> and uh, Dame Wendy Hall and I, I have, have no shortage of <laughs> stuff to do. But think about yeah. processing mm -hmm. the collection of Thurgood Marshall or yeah. just mm -hmm. really, or the books, mm -hmm. Ralph Ellison's private collection, all of his books. So mm -hmm. there, we're looking at museum techniques uh, and there are a lot of museums and research. The Huntington does a lot, uh, Huntington Library. We just are, have to look into that, the way that they present um, objects and artwork digitally and let people uh, get in. Uh, there's a museum that has uh, Martin Luther King's personal library and you can uh, touch the books and then it will open and show you on the screen and you could read what he read. So those types of things because the, after Ralph Ellison's personal library we have Oliver Wendell Holmes and Ralph uh, and Emerson's mm -hmm. books and Thomas Jefferson's initial library. So the opportunities for making those treasures available and uh, being able to manipulate them and then do your own research or do what, think about what are the topics. So we just signed a partnership with um, Howard University, it's a historically black college in um, Washington, D.C. And so the papers of the opera singer jo uh, Jesse Norman who is a Har Howard grad, and that's helping, so their students will help process and uh, intake that collection and also do new research. Lots of ways mm -hmm. that we could cooperate. Could we also cooperate with you on some of the research to do the preservation and integration oh. per se? because it's, it's exploiting collections, but just we got a tour of some of the work in the, uh, the folk life and folk art and realizing the silos of the print was in this system and the audio was in this system and the visual in this system, but you want to go and you want to get you know, Woody Guthrie's history and it's all split up in different pieces. And we have great scholars here who want to think about those integrative pieces. And yes. I, I would hope we could partner oh, on that process we need too. integration. We're good with silos. <laughs> <laughs> the principle, but that's because of the format and the volume. So you have prints and photographs, and then you get the Rosa Parks papers, but you have iconic photographs and prints and photographs. And so when you have that's, I want, uh, and I talk with the staff about this, it's okay that we have a lot of challenges because we're the largest library in the world with all kinds of formats. Hair, <laughs> what? <laughs> Dickens cane that he had. Just, Maps, I, let's not even talk about the map collection. <laughs> the map collection, we just acquired the map that the Japanese general used to report on Pearl Harbor to the emperor. And it is the most affecting thing to see because there is an X on Arizona. There's an X on that. And this is what he presented to him. So, it's okay that we let everybody know, we would like help. <laughs> <laughs> this treasure chest is everybody's. It's for the uh, people of this country. And we need to partner, and we need to get researchers in. We need to, it's a, it should be a learning lab for, this is the 
one of the best projects uh, that could ever happen in terms of information studies. How do you do this? It's, Smithsonian does a lot with their collection. That's why we keep going back to museums in a way too. And what, because their collection, we, we got a chance to go to the um, Broad. And it's very interesting how they show the stacks of their artwork and let people see what's behind there. So what if we let people see some of that miles of shelving? And as something's cataloged, say you come in from or the anywhere in the country, we're gonna do a treasures gallery, and you push, and then wherever you're from, the resources about where you're from come up. So the historic maps or the whatever. Wouldn't that be a nice visitor experience? <laughs> so that's, that's, so we need to, and that's why I'm out here now uh, saying we want to, open up this treasure chest and we would like to have uh, people involved. So of those 20, when we did that by the people, 20 on February 12th, 20,000 of the 28 letters have been transcribed. It, it took off like that. So we're gonna send bookmarks uh, to you, so please do it. Now there's only one thing about that, a couple of hiccups. Some of the young people can't read cursive. Right. <laughs> they can't. Yeah. So that's True. what we're, and then especially that uh, 18th, you know, 19th century handwriting, and then some of the handwriting's not that, you know, it's handwriting. And so that's, that's been hard. So this is another thing that we said, let's pair more mature people who can read the letter, <laughs> but can't do the transcribing, right? And you have the, and so we started that when we did the kickoff, and it was fun to see some of the most tour people reading the letter out loud, and the young person typing away. Yes. So that intergenerational part can even be with historic documents. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Head. You started us with Alberto uh, Mangels. Uh, powerful reflection on the power of reading, the power of the book, and how power is scared of reading and of the book sometimes. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you would, as a final set of reflections, share with us the two or three books that shaped your, your life. You know, when I think about that, and people ask that, and they want to say, what's your favorite book? And as a librarian, you're like, Every, the one I'm reading now. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> there is, I mean, I haven't read it yet. And that's the problem. So I have books about right. books, and decorating with books, and at home with books, and aspirational books over here, they're in sections, you know. It's just... We have graduate just, students that can help you archive. Right, oh, I got it. Oh, they're, they're, they're categorized. I don't we'll cook, but I have CDs. cookbooks. <laughs> and books about cookbooks. My mom is like, so then in the guest room, you have baskets to take away, you know, the books that you do for candy, like the MC Beaton books, you know. <laughs> Agatha Raisin, so you, you don't want to keep them. So when I think about that, that one book that I have and reflected on and talk about, though, is Bright April by Margaret D'Angeli, because that was part of her series. It was very, um, uh, she was very brave at a time in the late 40s and 50s. She published a series about different types of, of children. There was I, the Hannah, uh, there was a, one about a young Jewish child and people from different, and Bright April was about a uh, young brownie, African-American young girl, and I discovered it, and my mom says that's when I discovered finds. It was, because uh, <laughs> I would check out that book, and I don't remember, it was right across from PS 96, Jamaica, Queens, go to the library, little storefront, and I don't remember who, put it in my hand, but 
that I love to this day. I love that book. I talk about that book. And then when I started talking about it in this position, I started getting letters from people and meeting people. And the one that means the most to me is from a lady in Minneapolis who said she was a handicapped little girl in Minneapolis and bright April meant so much to her. And the thought that a little African-American girl in Jamaica, Queens, and this young girl loved that same book. And it was the first time that I saw somebody who looked like me. She had pigtails, she had two pigtails, she was a brownie, I was a brownie. I thought I looked like her. It, I just, even today, I can't see that book without feeling emotion, so. It, uh, that was the book that did it for me, because I loved reading, but then to love seeing yourself, because books are windows on the world, but they should be mirrors. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I give you the thank 14th you. Librarian <laughs> of Congress. The 14th. 14th Librarian of Congress. Thank you, the 14th. <laughs> Since 1802. <laughs> thank you so much. That was beautiful. Thank, oh, you. thank you. I'm not gonna. Oh, that was so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. And Sky. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it's run that way.